Okay, welcome to this week's episode of Buffy Boys. I'm Joe. And I'm Brian. Or am I? Pretty certain you are. Uh, and this week we are watching and reviewing I, Robot, You, Jane, Buffy's first Emmy winning episode. It isn't. No, it's really not. Oh, sorry. Okay, I sh- they didn't win any Emmys at all, right? They might have won a couple generally, but I think the only episode that they got nominated for writing was Hush, mm. I believe. Anyway. In terms of writing, who wrote and directed this okay, episode? Okay, so this is written by Ashley Gable and Thomas A. Swiden, or Swiden, I presume? Hmm. And was directed by Stephen Posey. And um, the Buffy wiki had basically nothing about these writers and directors, unfortunately. uh, Except for the fact that the writers also wrote Out of Sight, Out of Mind. So they must have just been booked for the block for this season, essentially. They haven't gone on to do any great things in independent theatre. I don't think so. The episode was first aired on April 28th, 1997. Good year. Um, It was okay. I don't remember too much from 1997 specifically. I think a Star Trek film came out that year. Um, Which one would it have been? First Contact, probably. That makes sense. Mm. Nice. That was great. So, Brian, in terms of what happened in this episode, we've just come off the high of the potentially the best episode of season one, Angel. Sure have. Uh, a, a series defining moment for Buffy. Yeah. And continuing the high in I, Robot, comma, you, Jane. What happened in this episode? Okay. So, previously, I've been recapping them um, based on my memory. And that was funny because I had a ba- I have such bad memory. But it's also just the worst audio. It's three minutes, and I've been editing the episodes recently, so it's been three minutes of me just going, uh, and, um, uh. I've gotten used to seeing the waveform of the noise I make going, um, because of them. I can see it. I don't even have to listen to it. I can recognize it visually and edit it out. Okay, so I'm going to read instead just summaries from a book I found, which are pretty good and pretty succinct. Is that, if that's okay? What's the book? Oh, this book specifically is Reading the Vampire Slayer, the new, updated, unofficial guide to Buffy and Angel, edited by Roz Cavini. And how have you found the book? You've been reading a lot of Buffy Stuggies books recently. I have. I haven't read this one yet. Okay. Yeah. The, the one I've been reading has been Why Buffy Matters by Rhonda Wilcox, which I found pretty good, really interesting, very engaged with the text, mm-hmm. but ultimately lacking in good conclusions. So there's like lots of stuff where she writes extensively about how light represents pain in Buffy so you get like Buffy jumping into the big old light at the end of season five but it kind of, and then it writes extensively about how Spike has a negative interaction with light and kind of ignores the fact that he's a vampire to be honest mm-hmm. which is presumably the ultimate point of the fact that he doesn't like light is that he's a fucking vampire yeah it's a key, key facet so there, it kind of ignores stuff like that every so often and it elevates Buffy beyond a television show without realising that it's great as a television show and uses the format so well so it's constantly referring to Dickens and uh, the essay I'm reading at the moment is about Elliot and the Wasteland and its connections with Restless which is cool it's really interesting but Buffy's good as a television show not as a cipher mm-hmm. for other mediums um, anyway, so I have another book that I'm going to read the watching columns from the summaries. They're pretty good. So uh, I robot you Jane, and this has I robot robot dash I comma robot dash you comma Jane, which is often listed as the episode title. Mm. But I'm pretty sure it's just I robot comma you Jane. Anyway, the scanning of Giles' rare cult volumes with help from techno pagan computer teacher Jenny Callender frees the demon Moloch to possess the net. He befriends and seduces various bright kids, including Willow, Willow, and builds a robot body for himself. Buffy traps him in this and destroys him. Well, that's not accurate. So yeah, I think that summary kind of really skips over what, for me, is like the central thing I remember about I Robot You Jane, which is Willow falling in love with a computer yep. person. Uh, and this makes it seem like it was just like another demonic romp in Sunnydale, but this is specifically the, you know, be afraid of your computer PSA episode of yeah. Buffy. It also ignores the fact that Buffy doesn't trap him in the body, so it just gets that wrong, you know? Yeah. But Buffy's the hero, so she gets she credit is. for everything. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, no, so this is definitely that TSA... Um, PSA. TSA. TSA is a very TSA different is, thing. Yeah, sorry. That PSA about uh, why not to trust people on the computer, and if you meet someone up on the, on the internet, they might turn out to be a bear. Which doesn't sound like that bad of a thing. A lot of the stuff I, re- I read about over the last week about just various episodes of Buffy... All of them refer to this episode, basically, because it's an indication of, you know, uh, real social issues that Buffy tackles via its monsters and how this represents the difficulties of technology and whatnot, Mm -hmm. which is just dull as fucking dishwater, you know? Yeah, and it's it's an odd one because when when the Buffy remake comes to pass, this is like a core episode that would have to be done differently because it's very much written for an audience that doesn't really understand technology 
to a certain degree yeah. like like th- this concept of, of t- the basically digital literacy is something that only people in computer science class have yeah like for example like when willow says that she met the demon moloch online who's going by the pseudonym malcolm buffy says online for what as if they're queuing up for something you know mm-hmm. and so like there's a, a lot of this where it's not just confined to giles who represents this obviously snobbishness around technology is that no one knows how to use computers because they're incredibly complicated. Absolutely. Um, when Buffy refers to them as e-letters in later on in the episode, that was a choice moment for me. It was just so fucking stupid. Yeah, so calling emails e-letters and be like, is there a way to find out who sent an e-letter? <laughs> It's a, it's a big of a dim moment. That was so odd. I didn't get that at all when he was talking about how you have to load up someone's profile and you could check that. What? Is that like is that is that like an old AIM thing that we just don't get or not AIM um, America Online AOL AOL No, I think it's like I think in terms of how they approach technology in this episode, it's both weird for us looking back and it's also inaccurate at the time to a certain degree. Yeah. Because I think I think I feel like there's a lot of different script edits on this in different places, and for one of them, the thing is that you know the profile thing makes sense if it's someone who's on the Sunnydale intranet, you know the local sure. thing. Whereas they kind of position that his like fake demon profile is eight, is a high school student who's eighty miles away. I just feel like a lot of that didn't translate. Yeah, you know? I totally agree. Here's a funny note for you. Okay, you know the monks at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So they're uh, um, from Italy in the 15th century for some reason. Yeah. It was a great opening scene. I loved the transition between them closing the box and Buffy opening the box. And what was she? What did she said? I have it here. It's a uh, oh great a book. Yeah, um, very convincing from Buffy Summers. Yes, yeah. so basically, like when there's, this is the first episode of Buffy that has a flashback in it. It's one of those weird oh, good first point. time, you know, notes, but specifically that they're flashing back to when Moloch, the corrupter, was originally captured in the 1400s. Yeah, 1400s. Yeah, in Italy, and then they transition into, and I, you know, into modern day Sunnydale. And I'm, I'm still questioning why did they feel the need to have a flashback but anyway you're about to say yeah so apparently one of the monks the monk who binds him is called Thelonious Mm -hmm. so what's that mean Thelonious monk yeah uh, jazz player yeah great jazz uh, pianist I think the the song I was associated with him is Straight No Chaser which is great but um, do you want to know how I know that no please how I knew that off the top of my head a couple of bad reasons go on oh one is that um, Commander Riker. I was going to say, Trek what Star Trek awfulness is there here? His his middle initial is T for Thelonious, oh. and it's because he's a jazz player. He plays a saxophone, and also there is a a Doctor Who villain called the Monk, mm-hmm. who at various points goes by the pseudonym Thelonious when he's on Earth. So oh, I kind of pick it up from that context. I okay, I for years have associated the saxophone specifically with Bill Clinton because I remember at some point hearing that Bill Clinton played the saxophone with Louis Armstrong mm-hmm. and Lisa Simpson. And Lisa, does he play with Lisa Simpson? There's definitely like a lot of association of. I don't think this ever happened, Joel. I think it might be a Mandela moment or a Mandela effect thing because I don't think I've ever, I've never been able to find reference to Bill Clinton having played the saxophone or jazz. But maybe I'm just not searching well enough. When you said that you thought this hadn't happened and you thought it was a Mandela moment, I thought you were referring to the time that I used to think that based on an episode of Sister Sister, I had misunderstood that Nelson Mandela was a white photographer from South Africa yeah. for a good 10 years. What is the Mandela effect in that way? Yeah, there's that TV show with the bears, with the Bernstein bears, or mm-hmm. the, that's included as an example of the Mandela effect, which is basically a socially remembered thing of, yeah, social memory that doesn't exist, basically. So something that you misremember, but other people misremember too, somehow. So one of them is, the famous one is apparently that Nelson Mandela had died in the 80s, Mm -hmm. which is fine. Um, My parents told us for years and years that, what's his name he did the voice of um, the guy in The Lion King and Star Wars? Oh, I should know this. He he does uh, Darth, uh, Darth, uh, the main James James Earl Jones James Earl Jones. My parents it. told us for years that James Earl Jones was dead, and we we're like, "That's sad." And found it recently. No, nope, not dead at all. Also, they told us that Stephen King was dead. So you can think of like, see, your family love when celebrities die. Like it's always a race to see who's the first person who can announce that a celebrity has died on the WhatsApp group, on the yeah. WhatsApp group, and yeah. then put a sad face. It's so true. Taken too soon. I always do it first. And then my parents always write back saying, yeah, I heard it on the radio an hour ago, Brian. It's like, well, fuck you too. The um, Mandela, is that a Mandela effect? Is that Man- what we're Mandela, yeah. Mandela effect. Oh, as in Nelson Mandela. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one for me is the fact that I'm, I find this very bizarre because I can't find any reference to it online when I, when I Google it to the fact that people get it wrong. 
but people consistently remember that line from Titanic as paint me like one of your French girls. Yeah. And like, draw me like one of your French girls. And you'll find it referenced almost everywhere as paint. I can't see where, like I've tried to find where it's introduced into the timeline before and it just doesn't, doesn't exist. It's a weird one. That's a definite, that's an adaptive one. Okay, here, so I have some information about the, the demon itself, himself, if you don't mind me rattling it off a little bit. Is this the first demon in Buffy? Oh, okay. So we have episode one, two, vampires, episode three, Witch. Witch. episode four, insect, mm. episode five, vampires, episode six is the pack, so... Not demons, like, I think both spirits? them and the spirits, yeah. Spirit possession. So yeah, this is our first demon, episode eight, obviously, angel, sorry, seven, angel, and this is our first demon. There we Ooh, go. Demons. He's a pretty specifically typical demon looking as well. Mm-hmm. He's very, like, this is the style of demon that they go for in the rest of the show. And actually, although I know it doesn't make sense, whenever I see the clip of this demon in the opening credits for season one, I always think it's Giles because there's an episode yeah. where he gets turned into yeah, a that's, demon. Yeah, that's in season four or yeah, five. Yeah, I, I know that, but I just think he looks really similar to it. He does, he anyway, does. hit me up with your demon facts. Okay, so Moloch is a false idol. Very specifically, he's often referred to as like the kind of the stereotypical false idol mm-hmm. god. So he was an ancient Canaanite god and he required sacrifices of children by burning them alive. So if you're talking about like false gods in the Bible and whatnot, you'd be referring to Moloch. It's also respe- spelled Molech, M-O-L-O-C-H, M-I-L-C-O-M, so basically Milcom or M-A-L-C-A-M, so all Malcolm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like variants. Uh, he features in Paradise Lost and Hell, and he appears in Stargate SG-1 at one point, and Supernatural. I definitely remember the reference in SG-1, I can't remember what it was, yeah, so that's yeah. interesting. Oh, and here's the, the best thing about him. He's often used as a symbol of pro-life support by what? pro-life people. Yeah, as in, like, as in to show how awful the pro-choice people are. They're like the They're Moloch's. demons? Yeah, the, the demons sacrificing children. That is absolutely bizarre. It is, isn't it? Oh, we should make this clear right now, if it, if it hasn't been clear already. This is a pro-choice podcast. Pro-choice podcast. Let's just put a nail our flag <laughs> to the mast there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Mum. Okay, that opening scene. That interaction between him and the monk nubile the, yeah. young monk who was in his Supple. Thrall. Supple. That was distinctly homoerotic. And so was his interactions with Fritz and Dave through the episode, right? Yeah, Fritz and Dave being the kind of modern-day computer geekoids that yeah. he enslaves. Indeed. It's a, yeah, it's a very, like dare I say, kind of like submissive dominance kind of thing going on. It's kind on. of Jeffrey Dahmery. Mm, that's a good shout. Because yeah. he does specifically, and as, as I'm sure you picked up on as well, he does specifically say, all I need from you is your love. Yes. Which is like, just not something that is like maybe Dracula at some point, but otherwise it's not carried through in any other interaction, I think, in this show for the most part. It's a very unusual way to phrase it. Yeah, that's a good point. Is this the only, you know, love-seeking demon? Yeah, what do they say? That specifically it's a demon of seduction and guile and that it preys on impressionable minds and all this. Yeah. And although I don't think it's specifically a reference, because I think that was a good point you made about the Jeffrey Dahmer thing, but one of the back... Okay, this is a very comic episode. Yes. And so there's a lot of background gags about how he's in the internet and doing bad things through the internet. And one is about how the FBI have had all their serial killer I profiles loved that. stolen. Loved it. That was my, that was my favorite little piece. And there's a little for you know our Irish fans. This will be you know a home truth. But there's a little bit about the Vatican. Uh, a news a news announcer saying that Vatican uh, officials have denied any financial discrepancy, saying mm. the money was just resting in their account, etc. That kind of thing. The announcer who makes that announcement is Joss Whedon. I know. You know. We read the same fucking Wikipedia page. Well, we did, because you told me to go and read it and find some interesting things to talk about. And then when I do, you put me on blast. Yeah, it's more fun. So that is indeed Joss Whedon. I actually have an interesting thing. I, I One of the quotes I read during the week about Joss Whedon, in terms of we were talking last week a little tiny bit, bit about like kind of auteur theory in Buffy. So people often accre- like accredit Joss Whedon with being the ultimate creator of the show. He's the person who has control of everything. And he does. So uh, Jane Espenson, who writes in season three briefly, um, but is also just a well-known writer, wrote for Star Trek and uh, Gilmore Girls, importantly. Uh, she, he, she says about Joss Whedon, Joss Whedon usually makes his own last pass you get the shooting draft and find his bits he has changed and what is stunning is how uniformly amazing his stuff is. So that's in reference to the scripts. Apparently he just, he had last pass on every script. He would change everything on mm-hmm. a consistent basis, which is really fascinating. Just it, it shows in the show in terms of how consistent it is. Um, not so much in this season, obviously, because there's not, nothing to be consistent with, but yeah. Yeah, it's odd because you have some genre fiction that specifically has this concept of a showrunner, mm-hmm. which is not something I think 
either the general public or, or in most cases you'd be familiar with outside of genre fiction. So Joss Whedon is probably one of the early examples. Alan Ball with uh, Six Feet Under. Alan Ball with Six Feet Under, definitely and specifically. Um, yeah. What's your man's name from The Wire? David Glimmer? Uh, no, I, I can't remember his name. It's whatever. Uh, Stephen Moffat for ex detriment, potentially with Doctor Who. There's another one that, that was right coming to mind there. Uh, JMS with Babylon 5. Sure. Specifically wrote Babylon 5 as a novel from start to finish for five seasons for the most part and, and played that out. So you get that this consistency here where you don't usually get it maybe in other more episodic or more kind of sessional TV programs that would be kind of, you know, mass consumed. Agreed, yeah. I'm um, actually on, on the note of Babylon 5. If you, dear listener, are, are listening and are in just enjoy 90s TV shows, maybe didn't have the patience for Star Trek because it's a bit bitty, but um, a bit racist, should, at the a bit racist well, be and honest. sexist. Oh, anyway, go back and watch Babylon 5 if you can find it somewhere. It's uh, Joel made me watch it years and years ago, and we actually never finished it. But um, I like I've, there are episodes where I genuinely was moved by it, and if I'm drunk and having a little bit of a cry, I'll think about that episode or an episode or two. It's just it's a very well structured show, and uh, it's intriguing in every way. It's 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 a it's a it's a gem from the past. Yeah, I'll just say very briefly. It basically tries to do the opposite of what Star Trek does. Star Trek specifically is designed to show a perfect future where there's no poverty and there's no discrimination and that's a very noble cause but it makes you very boring characters at certain times and Babylon 5 tries to say no we're still people in the 23rd century and we yeah. still have the same same problems that we have same football recommend sure. it that's my recommendation for this week yeah. I'm going to segue through Star Trek back to Babylon back to what's this show called Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer Buffy the Vampire Slayer yeah so the thing they use to capture Moloch in both the modern day and the past is a thing called the Circle of Kalos. Yeah. The only other context I know the word Kalos in is Kalos is essentially the Gog Prince of the Klingon race on, on Star Trek. Oh. So given, Spelled the same? Not spelled the same, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, the, it could be wrong in the in the subtitles of absolutely nothing else. Yeah, and I think it's probably being spelled a couple of different ways in Star Trek. I would wager, I'm pretty certain that that name Kalos in Star Trek goes back to the 60s. So, you know, a lot of the people obviously working on the show have been uh, nerds. So <laughs> I think it, that could potentially be a reference there. I'll buy it. Yeah, no, I believe you. Um, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. Okay, let's try taking a little bit more of a. Uh, let's try taking a little bit more of a linear approach to the episode. We get to the to the nineties, and they are scanning books as part of a digitization project, which is so interesting because, in one way, Buffy's definitely ahead of the cur- curve here. The the TV show is definitely ahead of the curve. It's unusual that they're running a digitization program in their school and they're approaching uh the internet so early in the show mm-hmm. if you'd said that this was an episode from 2002 in terms of themes not in terms of how it handles it i'd have believed it you know yeah because it's only in 1997 right it is yeah you know that buffy is actually the first instance in television of the word google being used as a verb it's not true because i think you said something like that before it turned out not to be true oh i probably made it up i'm 90 percent certain but yeah, so like, I'm pretty certain in season two or season five or six, uh, I think Anya says it, maybe, but, um, or no, Willow probably does. She says, I Googled it, but it's mm. the, in the Merriam-Webster or whatever you want to look it up, I, there's a good chance that the first uh, example of usage in re- recorded is going to be Buffy. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And I think that the most important thing that this episode gives us through its uh, technological plot is the introduction of... Computer Ms. science Calendar. teacher, Miss Calendar. Oh, here's an interesting thing for you about Miss Calendar. So Miss Calendar's uh, character in this was actually originally called Nikki. Nikki Calendar is supposed to jelly Jenny Calendar. Jelly Calendar. Jelly <laughs> Calendar. I'd love a jelly cal- calendar. We get a jelly every day. That'd be amazing. You would not eat but one a day from that No, calendar. I'd eat them all once. That's fine. It's like an advent, advent calendar. You don't eat them all day by day. But um, she was originally called Nikki Calendar. And obviously they don't use her name in this episode. Um, First name. Her first name. Mm. They just call her Miss Calendar. But uh, they change it to avoid confusion with Nicholas Brendan, who is referred to as Nikki on the show. Oh, weird. Uh, like uh, in the cast. Yes. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Not like Jane Calendar is a great, a, just a great character mm-hmm. because she is essentially, if anyone doesn't remember Jane Calendar, if you don't, I don't know what you're doing with your life. But she is a techno pagan and she's all about, you know, Giles is about how he is afraid of technology and books are the future and the past and, you know, all the kind of stuff. And she's very much like, no, get on the web, linking and download with the future man and cast some yeah. bones in cyberspace. Yeah. And she, she's a great foil for him. And they actually, I was, I, I was curious because obviously spoilers, they end up having a relationship. And I was really looking, I was like, do they have a chemistry? And they 100% do spark Absolutely off each other. Absolutely yeah. they do. I think I think Anthony Head probably has chemistry with anyone you put him in a room with because he's great. Well, um, he famously for years, he had chemistry with a cup of coffee, so. 
excuse me? He was on a, a famous coffee hour. I want to say Nescafe. Oh, he was. For about 16 years. Like, that was what he was known for when he wasn't yeah, doing yeah, this. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, good point. Yeah, um, I just looked it up. And yes, Google was used for the first time on television in Buffy. Ding, ding, ding. ding Brian's ding, ding. right if you're keeping track at home. Fourth episode of the final season. So there you go. Yeah, they definitely do have chemistry. It's wonderful. And she's a great character. She's, she arrives fully formed as so many Joss Whedon characters do. Um, mainly, I think, through the uh, characterization by the actress, who's great. Um, I have no idea what her name is. Did you uh, like her crimped hair in that scene in the in the, in the the lab? I did. And I also noticed that she was, again, a character that was wearing a kind of black leather jacket, a big uh, flares neck uh, tie-dye shirt. And consistently, there are characters in this show who look exactly like the vampire, or actually he wasn't a vampire in the end, but exactly like the guy in the very first episode where Buffy was like, you can spot a vampire because they don't they dress like it's the 70s. They don't dress up to date. Mm-hmm. And consistently, they have style characters who dress in the exact same out- it's, <laughs> outfit. It's yeah. so true. Um, okay, so in that first opening scene, there's a couple of great parts in it. So there's the um, line where Jaws says, I'll be in the Middle Ages, referring to a place in the library. Mm-hmm. And Calendar, Mrs. Calendar comes back with the amazing zinger, did you ever leave? And it's wonderful. Yeah, she does. Re- she'll read him for filth because it's a library. Fucking filth. But yeah, she brings with her like quite a lot of. Um, she introduces all these like stereotypical like computer nerds like they're and they're like they're really some like actually one of them's pretty okay. Dave. But the, Dave is like a pretty okay character. Yeah. But the other guy Fritz is like the one of the most broadly drawn caricatures that you see in a Buffy episode possibly ever. He's you know says things like the printed page is obsolete and if you're not jacked in. You're not alive. At one point, what was he saying? He said, "I'm." He said, he's saying, "I'm jacked in." I'm, I'm jacked, jacked in. in. I'm jacked in. While carving an M from Moloch into his arm and watching loads of like code stream past. Dude, on the it wasn't code. It was. It was literal. It was like formulas for algebra. He's like that meme, that popular it was, meme. It was like the quadratic equation and shit, and it's like that's not really that useful. It also reminded me a lot of uh, Richie Evans, I think his name was from um, Manic Street Preachers. Yes. Who during an interview with Enemy which is the worst magazine of all time, but regardless. Um, New New Musical Express is what it stands for. He was asked by the interviewer, how punk are you? And this guy, having genuine like mental problems, took out a blade and carved four reel into his arm mm. um, during the interview, and then about a year later went missing and has never been found. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, did you like what Willow was using to scan the pages? What was she using to scan the pages? It was like a handheld scanner. I think I've seen those before. They're very cool. They're really cool. If that's like a technology we can have, why don't we all use that? That's awesome. Yeah, and I think this is like a good time to point out that this is our first ding 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 Willow centric episode. Yeah, but it's not really. No? And like I mean that was one of my notes is that for a Willow centric episode, it is remarkably bereft of Willow moments. There's a couple of them, but like in the Xander episode, you had so much of him like, you know, walk, walking through the quad and his group and the other Xander episode, he got, like, seduced by a, a, an insect. And this one, Willow's remarkably absent for, from this episode for she a Willow episode. She's kind of a episode. plot vehicle, yeah. She is a plot vehicle. She, um, it's also an unusual one. Is Willow under his thrall, or is she not? The boys definitely are. But is it that she's under it and she breaks free, or is it that she's genuinely interacting with him on the basis of in which he's pre- presenting himself? No, I felt that she was genuinely interacting, and I think it, it was part of this way they characterize willow early on where she's you know she she at very least believes that she's not worthy of being friends with she's got low self-confidence and i think it's a more useful and more powerful situation for her to be in if she just is being a bit naive and has a difficult life lesson here and all that kind of stuff whereas i'm kind of okay with the the boys being portrayed as like being easily like brainwashed essentially but she just (laughs) makes a a poor life choice here Whenever they focus on her in these early episodes, then she's kind of characterized quite childishly. Sure. It's a little, like, even when she goes home and we see her house for the first time, it's a little kind of very, very schoolgirly coming home. But even, like, with introducing the house, like, it's one of the, it's weird because it's one of the scant references to much of their home life. Like, they acknowledge that she does have a mother and a father. They both live with her and she has a house. And that's kind of, like, pretty much close I know it's not entirely, but it's close to almost all we ever really get about her on the yeah, show. Yeah, for sure. I don't think we ever meet her father. Obviously, her mother's in that episode with the witch, with the um, kids who want to be burned at or want the witches Hansel to be burned. Hansel and Gretel. Yeah, yeah, Hansel and Gretel. But yeah, no, you're right. It's uh, You don't get much of it from her. And she's definitely played quite uh, childishly in this episode. I actually don't think I enjoyed her performance in this episode. What's her name again? <gasps> 
Alison Hannigan. Alison Hannigan. I don't think I massively enjoyed her performance. There are a couple of moments that were really sweet and very vulnerable. But that scene where she's talking to Buffy about how wonderful Malcolm is, I didn't believe her. I didn't believe the the inflection she was using. She was quite awkward and she was she she wasn't convincing. I'd be willing to say in her defense, it's difficult to be convincing because it was a bad script. Yeah, it really was. But actually, one of my favorite Willow things I picked out this episode was she's a framed picture of her and Giles in her locker. Yes, she Chicken does as well. I did indeed. It was <laughs> wonderful. Uh, why? Uh, was this this kind of exi- this is going to only have existed in the last like two months like let's say if this this show is taking two months so far like i'd be pushed out whether or not it was a cast photo because even though they were in costume it was clearly like a like the flash was on it was clearly yeah. a photo of them. have you ever seen those um lovely articles that pop up, pop up every so often of photo just polaroid photos and whatnot of the buffy cast hanging um like back in the 90s no oh they're wonderful it's just and anthony heads in all of them obviously but he it's just all of them like sitting around smiling and being friends and it's just really heartwarming it's lovely you like it. The handheld scanner, as I was mentioning, is called a scanomatic, which is beautiful. Okay. <laughs> you, this is something you took note of. It, it sure was. One of the other things, this is actually when, when we initially said that we wanted to do this podcast, there's a scene in this episode that specifically was like, I want to see that, I want to revisit that and think about that. And it was the guy on the staircase in, in the courtyard with, from context clues, what we can understand to be a laptop. <laughs> it doesn't look like any laptop or everything. It looks like he has an entire fax machine on his lap. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure. Like, surely at this time, if he does have a laptop, it must have cost thousands. At so, least $10. At least $10. And what he was using it for was to sit and announce to no one that essentially Moloch had broken into his computer and written an article about how Nazi Germany was the model of a well-ordered society for, yeah. his, for his essay that he was doing. <laughs> It was such a weird jumble of like, it was like looking at a scene from an alternate dimension. It was really bizarre. Yeah, no, it really was. A couple of weird things as well in terms of the kind of fashion of this episode. Like at one point in the courtyard in the high school, there was a guy walking around in a gi, like in that kind of Japanese um, dressing gown thing that you wear like uh, really? karate and stuff. Yeah, it was like a weird like Californian thing. Ooh. A lot of boys wearing earrings, a lot of yes. um, bowling shirts, essentially. And Buffy has, I, I would say, close to six goddamn costume changes she in this episode. Does. Scene to scene, she is wearing a different shirt with a different sparkly um, farmyard animal on it. It was a chibi cat, I think. There was a cat, but no, literally, like, the next scene, there was a different colour one that had a horse on it. And then at one point, she was dressed like Cordelia. Yeah, with a really short skirt, or dress. Really short dress, and then when there's that comic scene where she's tailing the guy mm-hmm. in Amazing. incognito, it's very good, and she has big red sunglasses and a giant fur coat. Yeah. It's like they went through like as many outfits as she's worn in the series so far in the course of every scene of this episode. It's so true. I, I, my, my number one fashion note from this episode was Xander is wearing a check shirt that was, of course, eight sizes too big, but it had like a flap. It had like a cape on top. You could like it was two separate parts on top, like where you could see that the shoulder part wasn't sewn in almost. So it was kind of like just flapping about on his back when he was running around. It was so odd. Well, you know that classic nineties fashion, the the shirt flap, shirt flap, back flap shirt. Because why not? It's really funny. Our like our conversation so far has been so bitty. I think that's because this episode is so fucking bitty. It's really bitty. Okay, very little happens. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I can tell you in, in, in a few seconds what happened in this episode. Demon gets trapped in a book, gets scanned into the computer. Willow falls in love with it. He seduces some, you know, pre bowling for Columbine, you know, computer hackers. Um, they try to kill Buffy. They, they actually, and there's a whole subplot about like a, a secret computer building society, which I'll talk about in a second, which serves no purpose. And he gets reconstituted there and they go and blow him up. That's all that happens. And there's some good interactions with Jenny Callender and Giles. That's the entire episode. It is, a, it, is a, it is a collection of concepts thrown into a script. Okay, well, this has been Buffy Boys, so we'll talk to you next week. Buffy Boys. Buffy Boys. But yeah, no, um, it's it's just, it's, it's so bitty. The, um, the, the dialogue throughout is awful. That part where he's saying, I'm jacked in, I'm jacked in. How did that get, like, how did they get that into the actor's mouth without someone saying, wait a second. Miss Vanjie. Miss Vanjie. Um, it's just, it's just so odd. <sighs> um, one of my favorite lines was um, when Giles, Buffy and Giles were talking, and Giles tells, or Buffy tells Giles that the boys aren't acting normal, and he says, 
those boys aren't sparkling normal, uh, sparklingly normal as it is. It was just so true and so mean. Yeah, he really amps up the kind of stereotypical Britishness here. Yeah. I think the thesis for this episode is when Giles says with absolute Shakespearean conviction, things involving the computer fill me with childlike terror. Mm. And someone wrote that on the back of a napkin and was like, I can build a whole episode about this. Oh, just God. give me a week. Ooh. Give me a lot of cocaine. You know, give me some, you know. Adderall. Some Adderall. Let me use the same full motion video pixelization graphics that they use for the Command and Conquer games. Oh my God, yeah. You know, let, let's throw all this stuff together. Some great special effects. I know a guy who speaks Italian. <laughs> I know a guy who's a monk outfit. My wife has a big fur coat. It'll work out fine. But it was that was the, the only the only point they had was computers can be bad sometimes. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, no, it was it was like I mean in in Buffy's defense, in the show's defense, it does very much debate computer usage and the the abilities of of the techno era because Jenny Callender's solution in the end is to use her uh, her her group of techno pagans across the country or world i'm not sure she gets on the forums uh, she gets on the forums she puts out a flash is what she says which is very funny to create a new circle of key snay something what was it called again kiss lay kiss uh, the circle of Kalis. circle of Kalis. so there is the indication that technology can sort itself out in the end and it's just the misuse of technology that's a problem yeah but it's, it's, it's characteristic of like some of this um early internet age depiction because some things turned out to be true and some didn't yeah, and she presents all of them as like, oh, it's just you know, it's just you know, this is completely normal stuff, Charles. You know, you scan things, you surf the web, you send out a flash. You know, you, sometimes your computer can talk to you in Microsoft Sam voice that can change tone depending on whether it's been mocking or not. Yeah, like there's, I, I understand it's like a, it's a narrative convention, but it's quite like a choppy one where Willow and Moloch are having this instant message chat. And what he is typing is being read out by the computer. So I'm like, eh, probably not going to be the case. She then responds to it while she's typing. And it's because you can't have yeah. an extended scene of two, uh, really one actor typing and reading the screen. So we're like, well, we have to, you know, it can't be an internal monologue. So we have to have her speak. And she just looks like a crazy person. And she uses the right, she uses the inflection and everything when, she, when Malcolm says that uh, Buffy was kicked out of her old school. And Willow says, wait, how do you know that? Because I never told you that. Malcolm says um, something like, oh, it's on her permanent record. But Willow's like, how do you know that? And yeah. It's like, well, Willow, you know, if you're like, I can buy some people muttered themselves when they're typing in the year 1997, but you're not. Yeah, I mean, come on. Ridiculous. And nothing like highlights it being a very basic portrayal of the internet thing. Re- repeated use of you've got mail. Yeah, I so I've probably said this before. I was so upset when I first got the internet because I thought that when I had a, a, an email account that I would get you've got mail notifications all the time, which don't exist. I I could definitely set that up for you. I would love that actually, to be honest. Also, we should highlight that the, one of the things they really hang around Shay Gong is Moloch, one of his thralls, one of his disciples, is this kid Dave, who for one thing he he kills him and makes it looks like it looks like a suicide. Hangs him in the computer science lab. Buffy walks in, rolls a one on her perception check, looks around, sees nothing. The frame moves to the left, and he's clearly hanging in the exact middle of the room. So odd, yeah. But when the, he is talking to Dave, he's like, oh, Dave, I have to get you to do this. I'm a computer. And it's like, oh, you're doing 2001, 2001 Space Odyssey, yeah. like very specifically. Yeah, for sure. Um, Even when he, when B- Willow wakes up in the computer lab, not the computer lab, the um the factory area, the the lighting is very much like, you know, lots of red lights bleeping out into the darkness and she's lit completely red. So it's very, very di- clearly a uh, 2001 reference. Yeah. And that, that computer lab, really, really odd area of the plot. So there's this computer lab outside of town. It was shut down. Big supplier of computer parks. And essentially the point is you get there, he can rebuild a computer body. So Dave is stalking it there. He's meeting with scientists. There's this whole thing about how supposedly the factory was shut down. Like secretly still operating that they never examine. And there's scientist characters present that are helping Moloch build his body. No one in this factory, this entire subplot, speaks. Not a single one of these computer science evil factory multinational people factorians factorians actually have a line and you, you possibly couldn't even see them from the script if they were there so i don't understand why they use that set at all yeah no it's a completely unnecessary addition if you just have that plot be that essentially what's happened is that the dave and fritz have been building this for him 
in the back garden kind of thing. Or in the computer science lab where they mentioned they've been, you know, Jenny says they've been putting too many errors, etc. Yeah, yeah, no, you'd leave that. It just was an unnecessary addition to the to the plot for sure. So one of my favorite parts was um, when uh, Mrs. Calendar comes in, Miss Calendar comes in to talk to Giles and Buffy, uh, she questions why Buffy and Xander are there. And Buffy says, we're literary. And Xander says the absolute classic line that, you know, I'm going get, to get a tattoo or something at some point, which is... Uh, to read makes our speaking English good. That definitely could be the name of a Buffy Stuggies essay. Oh, on... it is. I read one this week. Is it actually? Is that... No, I don't think so, but okay. it could be. Yeah. You got um, me. Yeah, sorry about that. So, okay, here's here's an actual discussion topic for us for this episode. Language. Buffy is often referred to as having two very distinct sets of language in the show. There's the language of the children and the people aware of what's going on and fighting against it. So it's the the, the Buffyisms the Slayer slang, and that uh, really beautiful way of speaking. Um, At one point, Buffy says in the episode, you're having an expression, or sorry, Willow says that, to Buffy because Buffy's judging her. And it's that kind of contradiction, or or nonsensical language that makes total sense. And it's really unique to Buffy, and it's great. But um, the other form of language is the adult speak. So it's people Mm -hmm. who, like the master speaking in grand soliloquies, and very Shakespearean in their tone, and very formal, um, which, you know, Giles very much is of but tends to flitter backwards and forwards trying to interact with the the kind of children speak. But that kind of language very much uh, resembles the patriarchy. My question is for you, Joel, how does Jenny Callender fall into that spectrum? I think the the key there is what you said with Giles being able to, to some extent, uh, code switch between the two, let's say. So he his arc is very much that he is a bastion of what we are unironically calling the patriarchy here, but kind of he- hegemonic, heteronormative, traditional society which Buffy is constantly deconstructing and his arc over the show is being an element of that old society and also a man who can adapt and can integrate and be progressive so he can change he has the capacity for change he does it a little bit where you often hear him and we've mentioned this before and he does it in this episode where he says oh no you were right mm, and he does a yeah, lot of I that noticed, I noticed that too yeah I can't so, remember what it was in reference to this episode. Yeah and I don't think it's, it's super relevant it was just like he's like oh wherever, wherever your point was I see where you're coming from child and the how they frame this and again it's about intelligibility for a t- television audience because some of these issues if you're going to present them as more esoteric people won't engage with it but when you say oh he likes old books and she likes new computers that's the same thing you're talking about but it's easier to grasp yeah and jenny is a, is a way for him to loosen his tie essentially and give him motivation to enter a more modern space and by the end of that arc be much closer to being able to move in this kind of like adaptive dynamic space which means when that world starts to come down the old world of the council and demon and quote unquote the way things have always been he doesn't die because he can move and he can change and adapt with it and what Buffy does with language is it basically very clearly says what you and I have always said about language being a living thing mm-hmm. that it's not this concept that there is a quote unquote right way to speak or right way to write or you know and it's something that might be not necessarily what you expect of two people with English literature degrees but what we came to understand from that was you know English as she is spoken <laughs> you know in, in, the language is how people speak and language evolves in that way and what we consider rules of grammar are really just common agreements about things but Buffy and the way that the characters in Buffy speak is very much about being willing to adjust and incorporate neologisms and neologisms are, are, are newly made words that are often a combination of, of other words and like, for the life of me I can't think of an example right now. Uh, okay, so um, nonsense words have become common. No, it's something like Slayerette. Yeah, okay, so, sorry, yeah. So they've taken Slayer and they... Sitch. What's the Sitch? S- what's the Sitch? Or, you know, ju- and just words that we then come to understand as um, or something like Bay. Mm. Yeah, that's something that people say now. Yeah. Those are all neologisms, and Buffy is very open to making those canon, essentially. And so what, what Giles is starting to do here is move in that direction. And, and, and to Giles is credit, I think. He's initially quite abrasive to mm-hmm. the whole idea. Yeah, where are you going to skim the books? Scan them? Scan's already a word, Giles. Come on. Yeah, exactly. And then, look, can you scan books with your eyes? But like, he, even though he says things like, um, you know, Oga's a demon in the internet and what could he possibly do about it, you know? Mm-hmm. When he sees the value of it, he adapts. He does. And that's the core thing here. There, and it's the same with language. It's the point they're trying to make across the show, not in this one episode, obviously, because it's not a very good episode. 
but it's this adaptability that's key. Okay, so it's your your ability to adapt via your language and your communication skills that um, marks children as being more uh, fluid and more able to change and able to deal with these kind of difficult issues is what you're kind of suggesting? Yeah, because I think if you, if you, you know, if you stop moving, if you become rigid or set in your ways in, in any context in this show, you die. Yeah, it's true. And the thesis is constantly there. Things that you think are permanent, like the like the high school, the, your mother, your mother, Sunnydale, eventually, in Angel, you know, their original offices, the hotel, a, a, yeah, the hotel. A very very core Joss Whedon thing he does with this is he blows them up and he says, "Don't believe in the center here. You you personally are the center. Yeah, places and things and concepts aren't the center. As you know, pro- probably the core ethos." of Buffy in the moment, you know, later on that will come to when she catches Angel's sword when he tries to kill her and says, you know, walks left when all that is gone, me? Yeah. That is the Buffy thesis. You are the center. And that's what language is trying to show us and how they use it is that ex- you use it if it doesn't bring you joy, discard it, essentially. <laughs> um, absolutely. So in terms of um, use of language and it's existing in, in fluid motion. So here's a problem for you, Joel. You know the phrase, you have another thing coming? I do. Yeah, there's a popular tweet recently that's been saying that apparently the accurate original form of that phrase is you have another think coming. But that doesn't sound right, Brian. Tell it doesn't sound right, it. and I don't like it, so we're not talking about it anymore. Goodbye, think. But why Why is that the case? Why is that the correct version of it? I, I didn't look into the etymology of it, but um, it's just, that's the original phrase. It's I have another think coming, and another thing coming is a... Uh, Americanism, I think, specifically. It is an, an Americanization. Ameri- Americanization? America, what, what did you say? Americanization. <laughs> Yeah. Or Americanism. An Americanism, absolutely. Yeah, but I'm not sure what the, the origin is. There's also just the... So, what do we talk, think about the accessibility issues in this episode? So, Giles very much represents the old world in this episode in terms of books, and books being less accessible than the digital world. Like, is that a form of snobbishness? Do we agree with him to some degree? I don't know if he's being snobby in the, in, the, in this case. I think he, he, if he if he does so, he does so accidentally. And the reason why I'm willing to stand for Giles here is he does have a, a bit of a monologue at the end where he zones in on... And actually, what I thought was very interesting was one of the things Jenny says to criticise him is that knowledge shouldn't just be for a few old white guys. Yeah. Which is a very modern thing. Is, like, that's something we would say very like very easily nowadays. It's very pretentious as to what the internet has become, which is a, a venue for, for anyone to learn and for anyone to uh, discuss, often to their detriment. But, you know, it is. It is. It is a great equalizer in terms of knowledge yeah definitely but i, I thought specifically because buffy doesn't always do great on racial issues yeah and it was kind of something where it's kind of like oh they actually make, make a point of saying that there's more intersectional issues here than than just gender or i thought it was a nice accessibility as well yeah i really liked it yeah but in terms of whether or not he's being snobby i don't think the reasons why he's doing it is because of the academy or because of the patriarchy or anything like that the point he makes about how books have a smell and they have context and culture and they have have to be earned and if you earn it the knowledge has value compared to the internet that he is presented with where he says that it's, it's here and it's gone it has no permanency it has no it has no worth he is kind of right there he just doesn't have the force like to see what it can become i think what jenny jenny isn't saying that this thing that's connected to a, mo- a modem the screeching in the side of the, of the library i don't think she's saying that that is the finished product but i think if giles again and i'll be interested to see how they approach these issues in the remake or the reboot but if he saw it now i think he would see that this so much indescribable and ephemeral context and culture around internet language and, and, the, and the fluidity of knowledge that is exactly what what Giles was trying to trying to get at I think it's a fear but it's a it's an understandable fear one of the interesting things about the internet is how consistently people say that the inter- uh, if it's on the internet it's there forever and what we've been learning the last five years or so of the internet is that things are not forever links expire pages go forever images that you think you thought were going to be accessible forever just someone no one thought to archive at some point torrent sites go torrent sites go you know what's really interesting games go there are some games that are just like that were available to purchase on the playstation 2009 or something that are now no longer licensed basically mm. and you can't purchase them anymore and they only exist in digital form so if you have a download of it great but you know that's not forever you know so it's, it's a really interesting one one of the one of the things about that about uh, Giles liking the smell. Did you know that it's considered to be a reasonable theory that a lot of the more insane nineteenth century poetry, the more kind of psychedelic mm-hmm. um, Kublai Khan is something I'm thinking there. Kublai Khan is one. I think you're also thinking um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, maybe. 
No, the the guy that my dad really likes actually. He, they got that like genuinely like like psychedelic. Rilke. Blake would be a great example of that as well. Yeah, sure. Apparently, um, a lot of uh, some influence there is the fact that at some point, uh, these people would all have been reading a lot of books in the library and whatnot, and there were fungi fungi that developed in these books mm-hmm. that were psychedelic that people would have been smelling and creating psychedelic interactions. And who were these fun guys? Were they friends uh, of theirs? Or I'm sorry. This has been Buffy Boys. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs> this has been our relationship. Goodbye. <laughs> but um, isn't there a thing specifically that the smell of old books is book mics or that there's actual like tiny yeah. microbes that specifically generate that, that smell? I do believe so. Um, it has to be. Yeah. Um, okay. So at one point, Giles says he refers to something as a fabulous web page. Mm. And I want Giles to visit our web page and say that it's fabulous. He specifically calls it a fabulous web space page. Yeah. And it's something that people of a certain generation who I interact with, who shall remain nameless, specifically still refer to things to me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I work in a very website orientated job and it's very much like a web site, website, <laughs> um, which I find very endearing because the web was a, it's definitely a prefix that was amended to normal things. Yeah, yeah. A Absolutely. web letter, yeah. You know? <laughs> okay, here. Do we have much more to discuss here? Because I think we're actually like running out of time, and we don't want to keep this episode reasonably short. Yeah, well, I, I think we've nothing more to discuss because there wasn't a lot going on in the episode. It was very funny. It was a weird attempt to make a point. Basically, the gang discover catfishing. Like, yeah. literally, think they've invented the concept of someone pr- pr- pretending to be someone else online. Buffy does a, a pretty good job of deducing again. Like, we don't really give her any credit for her investigative skills, but she just, you know, she takes a couple of pieces of evidence and she's like, oh, he's a demon trapped in the computer. He's the dude's willow. I was like, that's a leap, but like, I'm happy with it. Something I would like to look at in future mm-hmm. because it's not super relevant in this episode, but something we never really talk about is the fact that Willow is Jewish. She is. And she's two Jewish parents, obviously, Mr. and Mrs. Rosenberg, etc. And I would just be interested in talking about how, if that carries through or thematically in later, later yeah. seasons, I, I feel like that part of her identity kind of fades into, for obvious reasons, fades into the background. But I think it might be an interesting thing to bear in mind because there's not a lot of mm. minority, minorities that we're looking for, but... Um, but uh, do you co- feel are minorities? Yeah, but I suppose I just mean... The, you, you don't get a lot of context on what people's cultural backgrounds are, what their yeah. churches are, etc. This is one concrete piece of information we have. It's a funny one because obviously this show very much undermines any sort of faith, both ways. I mean that. but it, like, So religion doesn't really stand comfortably with this show. I don't know. But, gogs are real and they want to kill you. Yeah, exactly. But um, the Jewish faith, I think, as a cultural identity is very distinct to uh, other faiths, you know, because uh, being Jewish, culturally Jewish, is so much more of a thing than being culturally Catholic or Christian. So um, it does occur once or twice. She refers to not wanting to do any Christmas stuff mm-hmm. because, you know, Jewish, I think. But no, yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting thing to it's look at. It's interesting to keep in the back of the mind, I think. Yeah, no, for sure. I have a couple of notes here. Uh, while you're making meow noises, let's just do a quick count of who dies in this episode. Yep, let's. So there is a, uh, I'm sure he has a name, let's call him Theodore, the monk in the opening scene with Thelon- the mullet. Thelonius? No, that, the, the monk who gets captures, killed. Is the monk who gets killed Thelonius? No, I don't know his name, so I'm okay. making up a name. Grant. Um, there is Fricks get, gets his neck snapped, and there is Dave and his foe suicide. I think that might be it. I think it's a relatively murder light episode. Yeah, no, it's the. I think it's just the three of them. Yeah, and obviously Moloch or IP. He does indeed get uh, zapped to bits. Um, did you find his costume quite predatory? It was, yeah. So it was a big horned demon, which was quite a lot like that demon in Dragon Age 3 that I keep trying to play, and I never get around to doing it. And it was turned into a, a robo-like demon, so it just looked like a predator, which is also spoilers for the end of the most recent predator film, where there's a robot predator, and it wasn't very good. It was awful. Yeah, no, definitely predator there. I also thought that M- Malcolm was actually reasonably funny in the end. Like, he was quite witty in his conversation, which was quite interesting. He had a weird amount of personality for a throwaway demon in a bad episode. No, for sure. Um, the image of the three friends as they as they get thrown back and they're huddling away from him mm-hmm. as he explodes in the, at the very end of the, se- of the, of the episode, mm-hmm. that was really sweet, just the three of them huddling up together. It was it was a great like screenshotable kind of moment that you'd yeah. if you were looking back on your time on this show after having made it you'd be real happy with that. I mean, I think that segues very well into the final shot of the show, which is yeah. actually quite a strong scene if you Absolutely. want to lift the gate or the episode. <laughs> <laughs> the final shot of the show is also quite strong, but yeah, no, it, it is quite a strong scene and it, it's very beautifully. Uh, so the line is, let's face it, none of us is ever going to have a happy normal relationship 
we're doomed and they're all laughing and they just go silent and there's like 10 seconds of uncomfortable silence where it fades away yep it's really it's cr- pretty great and uh buffy identifies that like you know oh i didn't you know look at me willow i've only gone out with a vampire the only person i'm interested in is a vampire which of course <laughs> you know is pretty much emblematic of buffy forever and Xander says yeah and the person who i was interested in was an insect monster which precludes Xander's interest in monsters for the rest of the show yeah and so kind of like foreshadows you know he does have well that's a thing he he has all monster relationships mm-hmm. um except for faith separate faith well different kind of monster and buffy which i thought was quite funny she's like i've only been interested in one boy since i came to sunnydale angel and i was like well owen can go fuck himself apparently <laughs> yeah yeah well she wasn't that interested in, in owen was she well, no, but like I think if you're listing your your many conquests at the age of sixteen, like I think the two guys you date in the last four months or whatever are going. Yeah, and fuck you, Luke Perry. So does Miss Calendar suggest that she has a genital piercing? I don't know what to make of that, but I think you need to give context for what she says. Yeah. So Zan- uh, Giles has found a uh, earring in the uh, like a big corkscrew earring in amongst the books after they've cleared up all the mess from the library, and he brings it to Miss Calendar and says, "I think you misplaced this." It's one of your earrings, or you can wear it in your ear or something like that. And she says, I don't wear that in my ear. So it very much suggests it's either a nipple or genital piercing. Uh, 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 my head canon is it's one of those things that you say sometimes that you think sounds either funny or flirty. And then you're like, oh, shit. Grandma's chicken salad. Like that kind of thing. It's like, why did I say that in that tone? Yeah. That's okay. I, I like that. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, with that note, I think we should wrap up. No other dangling notes? No, it was pretty light. It was a funny episode. Yeah. I can make a reference to the fact that he was a cyber demon, which is also the main enemy in the Doom video game. And mm. you have to wonder if there's just a few nerdy references tied into this episode it wasn't it was a, it was a great season one episode of buffy i think it was really emblematic of season one it was not a good episode of buffy the vampire slayer the tv program agreed okay so i'm going to rate this episode a should i rate it first so you don't get salty with me okay i have i have my i have my number written down in my brain if you want so just have a but yeah you can go okay first. so i am going if you steal to... my thing then i'm going to be very annoyed go on i'm going to rate it four and a half modems okay great i'm going to rate it 5.0 clit piercings out of 10 mother of god i'm so sorry well this has been buffy boys uh, so just for the end here and go very quickly uh, I, I actually i'm gonna say i, I watched I, i'm a nerd i know uh, in many different ways i know i watched an online training course on how to be a podcaster the other day and one of the one of the sections was about calls to action and that's a bit where we say please go and do these things for us yeah and they said you should limit it to two because if you ask people to do more than two things for you for free, they won't do it. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, um, if you're enjoying this, if you think there's someone you know who either knows Buffy or doesn't know Buffy and just wants to listen to Two Queers Shite on, please recommend their podcast to them. That'd be really appreciated. And if you want to, follow us on Twitter because I use Twitter regularly and I would appreciate that. So thank you very much. Yeah, cheers. I told my, my, my family to listen to this this week and I talked to my mom the other day and I was like, oh, did you listen to Buffy? And she's like, ha 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 no <laughs> so thanks mom yeah i would tell my family but i'm an orphan yeah you're an orphan your mother listens to this and she's gonna be so annoyed that you said that that woman's not my mother she's an actor this has been a long a long con won't be surprised okay do you want to harmonize as we say buffy boys okay mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, buffy, buffy boys. boys see ya